It's great to see everybody here. Some old friends. I saw some familiar names and some new friends. Uh, my name is Zhang Mei. I'm founder of Wild China, and welcome to our 81st event. I see that uh, this was since the pandemic started. We've done a few of the, such conversations on cons uh, conservation. You probably have joined previously. We had Dr. Jane Goodall and uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick joining us on Long Yongchen talking about primates. We, have, we had Kyle Oberman talking about Chinese national parks. We also had Ed Norton um, joining us you're talking about cons uh, rafting down the three great rivers in Yunnan. So today, as you see on the screen, I'm super, super excited to have Dr. Justine Shanti Alexander joining us at 3 a.m. her time, uh, and uh, Terry Townsend joining us from Beijing on snow leopard uh, conservation efforts in China. Uh, as usual, uh, a few words on logistics. It's one hour long. And uh, I think both Justine and um, Terry will take about 10 to 15 minutes to share with us a little bit about their work. Then we launch into the Q&A. We have a couple of pre-submitted, but if you mm -hmm. have more questions, either in the chat box or in the Q&A box, uh, we'll try to get to them. Now, a few words on our experts. Mm -hmm. I'll begin with <laughs> Justine um, Shanti Alexander. In the world of snow leopards, Justine is a very, very familiar name. It's very well, she's very well known, very well regarded, and she holds a PhD in snow leopard population assessments from Beijing Forestry University and a MSc in conservation science from Imperial College London. She is the regional ecologist for the Snow Leopard Trust, and she is the executive director of the Snow Leopard Network, where she has worked to build links between conservationists on the ground and scientists across the snow leopard range, both in China, uh, Mongolia, Kyrgyzstan, Pakistan, India, my favorite area. It's just like the, the dreamy, most beautiful area. Uh, Justine is also an advisor to the population assessment of the world's snow leopards. It's called PAWS, right? And works separately to support and promote women in conservation. Um, so Justine, the number you give us about snow leopards population today is going to be authoritative. I know that. <laughs> You've spent so much time studying the population. So we're super excited to have you. And our second panelist um, is uh, Terry Townsend. Terry is a Beijing-based consultant on climate change and biodiversity. And in 2016, in partnership with Shanshui Conservation Center, he devised and helped to set up a community-based wildlife, um, wildlife conservation, a uh, wildlife watching project with yak herders on the Qinghai and Tibetan Plateau. Again, this is like the most beautiful area in China. It's very um, little known, but it's absolutely stunning. And we'll get to see some pictures, I believe, in a second. And this project called Valley of the Cats is an incredible example of how ecotourism and conservation work, working side by side. And um, if you're in front of a computer, you can also look it up. It's valleyofthecats.org. And he'll be talking more about it here shortly. And uh, Terry is also a big birder. So he's a big name in the birding community in Beijing. He's the founder of the Birding Beijing. Uh, that's an organization set up to celebrate birds and other wildlife in the capital of China. People don't think of Beijing with any wildlife, but um, we'll hear more. We hope to have, actually have a dedicated session, Terry, to hear mm. you talk about wildlife in Beijing. He is also a fellow of the Paulson Institute and serves on the global advisory group of BirdLife International. So we're very excited to have um, Terry and Justine joining us. And I'll start, maybe I'll just hand things over. Justine, we'll hear from you first uh, about your work about snow leopard conservation in China, and then we'll move on to Terry. How does that sound? Perfect. And Terry has uh, gracefully agreed to share my slides. So thank you, Terry. Um, uh, that's perfect. So, um, so yeah, good morning, everyone, and good afternoon. It's really a pleasure to be here. And finally, great to meet also Mei Zhang. Thank you for welcoming us. 
Um, so today I've been asked to share with you a little quick overview about snow leopard conservation in China. So both the challenges, but also the unique contributions that China is making to the species protection. Um, and a huge special thank you to Wild China for the invitation. So next. So if I see that many of you are not there yet, so let's all travel to China and get there. So you can see here on the map, you see the sweeping mountains that are found in China, uh, in China and also in Central and South Asia. And to get us warmed up, I just want to have a quick a question for you. How many wildcat species do you think are in China? So there are around estimated 37 to 42 different wildcat species in the world, but how many are in China? So you can write it in the chat. I might not be able to see what comes up, but um, just have a, a few guests. So there are 37 to 42 in the world. Okay, I see that Karen has said 22. Other, Heidi has said seven. Okay, they're coming in. May has said they're 35. Okay, so without any ado, next, uh, Terry, you can here get a glimpse of a certain number of them. There are at least 12. There might be even more. And China's geography is extremely diverse, as many of you will know, with the coastal regions, the grasslands, the river valleys, and of course, the high plateaus and the rivers. And get, this gives space to 12 different unique wildcat species found throughout the country. And here are a picture of a few of these. Um, but we're going to focus on one special one. So next, we are going to focus on a big cat. So a big cat species uh, belongs to the genus Panthera. And of these three species in China, there is the tiger that you'll see on the left, there is the common leopard that you see on the right, and of course the snow leopard. So all of these are class one protected species in China. So that means they're prohibited to hunt or capture them. And tigers and leopards have been unfortunately reduced to only a few isolated and fragmented populations in the country. So for example, for the tiger in 2010, a census by WCS estimated that there were around 50 tigers left in the wild and that they weren't from viable populations. But of all of these three species, the snow leopard is the only one whose populations remain largely intact and viable and continues to be distributed over large landscapes of the country. So why is that? I'll just share a little bit more today. So next. So one factor, which maybe many of you know, is that the species is extremely elusive, right? And, and has this elusive nature. And it's known for its being an expert at camouflaging in its brown, gray, rugged mountain habitat, allowing them to ambush their favorite prey, such as the ibex or the blue sheep. So can you spot the snow leopard here, found and pictured in its typical barren landscape? So I'll give you around, you know, a few seconds to look and see. So imagine you're in the field. So you're, we're all in the field together and we're looking up in, at this ridge line. Can we see that snow leopard that might be right in front of us, but we're, we can barely see with our eyes. So uh, Terry, next. Now we're using our binoculars. So we get a little bit closer and we see maybe that there's a cat in front of us. And then next, I'll give you the answer. Um, there are actually three cats confirmed by our colleague, uh, Bedzad Larry, who actually photographed this when he was watching them and observing them from the neighboring ridge. And he saw these three cats move away and it would be a mother and her two sub-adults. And then the one in the back is a bit tricky, especially on a Zoom screen, but we can believe Barry, the, uh, Bedzad Larry, that they were there. But this is the kind of observations you might get in the field. And as you can see, they completely camouflage in their surroundings. Next, snow leopards are also known to occur at very low densities. So we estimate there's average of one individual per 100 kilometers squared in this in favorable habitats. 
And here is a movement of a female snow leopard individual that we call her moving in her home range over several months. So snow leopards have really large home ranges and males are estimated to have home ranges above 200 kilometers squared females over 100 kilometers squared. And they're recorded to travel on average, but lots of variations, seven kilometers in one day. So this means that even if you were within the snow leopard home range, a sighting would be really rare and very exciting. But we do note from our data that 75% of the time they are found resting. So let's just hope you come along a resting site so that you see it staying sleeping because at 75% of the day it's resting. Next. So another big reason, major factor that might be at play about why the snow leopard has done better than the tiger and the leopard relates to China's economic and human development pattern that has really concentrated on the Eastern coastal belt. Right? So that leaves the Western frontier less occupied and still relatively wild. So here in this map, you see the orange circles. And these are estimates of the population, human population across the country in 2017. So you'll see in the West, there are many few pe fewer people. And you also see in purple, the snow leopard range and it almost matches this lower density of where there are less people. And this consists of the higher dry mountains and desert mountains of China. So these rocky areas are the perfect natural habitat for this species and, and where we predict most of the population occurs. Next. So as you can see from uh, this map as well, snow leopards are found in seven different provinces in China. So all the way from Sichuan, Qinghai, Xinjiang, Xizang, and even Inner Mongolia, there might be some uh, isolated populations. And China is predicted to host over 50 to 60% of the world's predicted suitable snow leopard habitat. So it's, that's really important and essential. And it is important to note that large areas of the snow leopard range in China are protected. So here in orange are the protected areas or even the new national park system uh, that you can see covers large areas of the snow leopard range in China. Um, and many of these national parks are actually really big as well. So that makes them really viable to protect uh, snow leopard populations. Next. For example, you heard Sanjur and Yuan, the protected area mentioned already. Well, this, this uh, protected area is half the size of Kyrgyzstan, which is another snow leopard range country. So as you can imagine, the protected areas are also uh, massive. And this is vital because as I mentioned before, snow leopards have huge home ranges. So if we wanna protect the population, we need to protect several thousands of kilometers squared that are secured and connected uh, throughout their range. But perhaps what's more importantly, and as you can also mm -hmm. see in this map, is that there are large areas of the snow leopard range outside protected areas. And that is the areas you still see in uh, purple. And this is one of the biggest challenges for snow leopard conservation in China and elsewhere in the world. So next. So now I'm gonna talk about how many snow leopards there are in China, especially since Mei Zhang made that special request. Um, so, I mean, that's the, the first question we often get asked, how many snow leopards are there in China? And to be honest, I think we still have very much a guesstimate, we say. So it's a guess estimate. And we don't really know, but we roughly stay around 2000 to 2500 based on the suitable habitat. But we actually have very little information on population numbers. So this map was created by the Snow Leopard Network China in 2018, and it shows the locations where snow leopards have been confirmed. So those are in the black dots here. And it also shows where there have been more rigorous assessments of how many snow leopards there are in the redder areas. And I mean, this is impressive and it keeps growing and it includes areas also outside protected areas, which is, is really encouraging, right? However, there are really huge gaps and only 1.7% of the cats range in the country in China has been surveyed. And this is similar in other countries as well. But as you can see, that's a tiny percentage of where snow leopards could be. 
but we're having a growing understanding of where they are at least, which is really encouraging, but we don't have a clear picture of how many cats there are or what's happening to the population generally. Next. So we know where snow leopards persist, but we also know that the snow leopards world, the habitat is changing fast. So that means the threats are there. There are threats and they're real. And the recent 2018 report highlighted that the main threats actually vary across the different provinces in China, because as you can imagine, these are huge areas and they all vary in different ecology, different activities. Um, but the num there's a number of emerging threats such as in Qinghai province, stray dogs have become a major concern and mostly due to the collapse of the Tibetan Mastiff market and subsequent abandonment of many dogs. So if you look really closely again in this picture, you'll see in the back a snow leopard with two Tibetan Mastiffs chasing it away. There are also of course other threats such as killing of individuals and also killing of their prey encroachment on habitats such as mining and development. Um, that again, vary throughout the range. Next. And of course there is climate change, which is influencing their habitat and interacting with these other threats in ways that we don't really fully understand. So here's a, a camera trap picture by Shang Shui um, in the same location, they captured snow leopard and common leopard, which is astonishing because we predict that with climate change, the tree line will be increasing, right, in elevation. And this will create better habitat for species such as the larger common leopard that might encroach on the snow leopard habitat. But of course, humans may also encroach further on snow leopard habitat as well, which will be a further threat with climate change. Next. So we have to deal with each of these threats, um, but as the at the heart of our conservation is the question of coexistence, right? So it's not only protected areas, it's also outside protected areas. And we have to put people at the center of this um, when we put forward conservation approaches to protect the elusive cat. Next. So as we put people at the center of our efforts, we especially need to think about people that are living alongside the snow leopard. So this means building conservation approaches that recognize people and communities across snow leopard habitats as equal partners in our efforts. They can bolster larger national efforts and without their support, long-term success is really unlikely. So how do we take that forward? I don't really have time really to go into this today. I've already uh, going a little bit over time, but I just wanna share you quickly a few small examples uh, of actions being on, done on the ground in China that are really quite innovative. And then I'll let Terry take that forward and share his story from Sandra Nguyen. So let's travel finally to Sandra Nguyen, Qinghai province, um, and learn more about Shang Shui Conservation Center, which is a national NGO in China. And it's a, a national par partner with the Snow Leopard Trust, and they also support the Snow Leopard Network. And they've been leading the way in getting local involvement in research and conservation of snow leopards, especially in Qinghai. Next. So you'll see here, a community leader in Sanjuan Yuan, Qinghai province, discussing local plans uh, with a, uh, a, a Shang Shui staff. And Shang Shui has been working there since 2009, setting up programs that support people's livelihoods and foster community actions around protecting the snow leopard in their own uh, areas where they herd their livestock, where they live. And these plans often come from within the community. So the conservation programs are really tailored to the local setting and the threats that exist, but also to people's needs and what people can do, their capacities, their interests. Next. So as an example, the team has set up a system that engages majority of the households in this community in Angsai village in Qinghai. And it's a camera trapping effort and it's referred to as a citizen science camera trapping survey. Next. And here's a little video of it in action. So each household manages one camera trap that they uh, find a location in their pasture land. They set it up, they collect it, they support the monitoring effort. And then it's coordinated across the landscapes with all of these households. So these uh, households, these herders have become active uh, 
support in the monitoring efforts. They're local leaders in the conservation of snow leopards. It also allows us to cover huge areas of snow leopard range through their support and build our better understanding, again, of how many snow leopards there are, because as I mentioned, we don't really know this, right? And we can then monitor populations. So here you can see uh, uh, the team setting up that camera um, and just checking uh, if it would actually capture a snow leopard by uh, imitating a snow leopard. We all do that now <laughs> so when we set up our cameras. Um, so these efforts have been replicated across China and other parts of the snow leopard range. So finally, before ending, I just wanted to uh, yeah. remind everyone, so Terry next, um, that China has half or more of the world's snow leopards. That's what we predict. So what happens in China will be vital for the future of the species. And uh, China also has the unique ability to take things to scale, right? And that's what we need for the species. And, and focusing on coexistence with uh, local communities, local people. Um, so unlike the leopard and the tiger, we still have a time to like hold the line to protect existing snow leopard habitat, which is really encouraging. And I think that's why many of us are really hopeful as we work on this species to try to protect it, especially in a country like China, where there has been a lot of work by the government, by different civil societies and by academics working to protect. So I'm gonna now pass it off to Terry, who's going to share further his story working in Sandra and Yen and working with communities um, and looking at tourism which is actually increasing throughout the snow leopard range. Um, in some areas, it can be seen as a threat. So it's really important to, to work with communities and to work with the tourism industry to find opportunities to strengthen actually conservation work as tourism increases as well. Um, so I'm really glad that uh, Terry could share more about this. So over to you, Terry. Thank you. Thank you, Justine. Absolutely fascinating. Uh, Terry, yeah, let's hear, wow, beautiful photos. <laughs> yeah, thanks to Justine. Just like to say, it's um, uh, a, a great honor to be here today on um, this Wild China webinar, and and also to share the platform with Justine, who's worked incredibly hard over many years and uh, on snow leopards in China, and has has really also built up this uh, organization called the Snow Leopard Network. So getting countries to work together across the range. So she's been incredibly instrumental in that. Um, so so yes, thank you and and. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Um, I'm going to talk, build on what Justine has talked about in terms of the, the sort of conservation of snow leopards and uh, specifically tell you a bit of a story about a project um, in uh, San Zhang Yuan uh, National Park, uh, working with local communities there to set up uh, a community based uh, wildlife watching tourism project. Uh, and so the story really starts um, back in August 2016, and um, you might realize that this isn't actually a snow leopard on the screen. Um, this is something called a palace's cat, uh, which is another one of the cats that, that uh, Justine mentioned at the beginning of, uh, of her uh, presentation. And it's a really another really elusive cat that's very rarely seen in the wild. And back in uh, August 2016, I made my first visit to Qinghai, and on my birthday, I was so, so fortunate to stumble across uh, this little family of palaces cats uh, near Qinghai Lake. Um, and at the time, this was the first video of these cats taken in the wild during the daytime. Uh, so I was incredibly fortunate to capture this, this footage of a mother um, and her two kittens. And the reason why I mention this is that it was, just after I had seen these cats, I was walking out of this valley back to the car um, and I received a phone call from Shanshui Conservation Center. And I was so excited to tell them all about my palace's cat sighting. Um, and uh, they, they uh, invited me to come to Angsai to participate in a wildlife watching um, competition. And um, because I was already in Qinghai and it was only a few days later, I was able to change my flights and, uh, and make it there. And they wanted me to be a judge for the, for the bird part of this competition. So um, Justine already mentioned uh, Shanshui Conservation Center. I'd just like to emphasize what a brilliant organization it is. It's, it's uh, 
a really fantastic Chinese NGO started by Professor Lu Zhe in 2007. Uh, Professor Lu is, is probably China's most famous conservationist. Um, and they focus very much on communities, uh, as Justine mentioned. And so they, they also focus mainly on the Tibetan Plateau, Sanjiang Yuan area. They work in, on urban wildlife also in Beijing and Shanghai, but the majority of their effort is, is on the plateau. Um, so I make my way to Angsai, and this is sort of the first view that you get as you're coming into the valley. And it's, um, you know, my, my mouth was wide open, uh, just gobsmacked at the, at the views. And, and this valley is, is quite untypical of the Tibetan plateau. It's not sort of barren grassland. We have these sort of steep sided valleys uh, often wooded as well, which is not typical. And you've got the Mekong River uh, running through uh, the Yangtze Valley. So it's a spectacular location, uh, many unique plants, animals, uh, and birds. And before very long, you meet the local people and um, almost inevitably, they will invite you in for tea. Uh, they're some of the most friendly people you will ever meet. Uh, they're the most colourful people you'll ever meet, and they're also the happiest people you'll ever meet. Um, their, their life is, is fairly basic by our standards, but uh, they, they really are uh, happy with their lot. Um, this is a typical year to home, herd at home, and um, when you meet the people, they will always invite you in for tea and bread. And so you go inside, this is sort of inside a typical family house, um, you can see the stove there is at the center and the yak is really everything uh, that they need so they use everything on the yak they eat the meat they use the hair to make tents and they even use the, the dung dried dung as fuel so this stove will be fueled by uh, dried yak dung uh, some of the people amazing characters and so after having tea in about three houses on the way i eventually made it to the camp um, and this is, this is the camp, the Shanshui camp for the Wildlife Watching Festival. And what these festivals do is they bring together a lot of young people from all over China, usually teams of three. And the idea is that over three days, you take photographs of as many plants, uh, animals and birds as possible. And so this provides a snapshot of the biodiversity in the area. So it's a sort of very quick and dirty way of of getting a quick understanding of what wildlife is there. So many of these places where these festivals are held are very poorly known. Um, they've not really been surveyed properly. You know, the plateau is a vast area. And so there's still a lot to discover. So they provide a snapshot. They also help to raise awareness about the rich biodiversity um, and sense of pride among the community. So often you know, the communities lived there for generations are taken for granted. And um, you know, having these people come and, and saying how special this place is, you know, they, they sort of build a sense of, of pride in that. Um, they hire obviously the local people to be drivers and guides and to run the camps. So there's a supplementary income uh, element to it as well. And of course the local government is, is happy because they uh, get increased focus and often the media will come to these events and provide coverage. So um, on arrival at the camp, yeah, I was supposed to be a judge for the birds. And um, on the first morning, the, the organizers asked me if I could join a team of two young students who didn't have much experience of, of nature watching. Most teams are three people. So uh, these two students uh, wanted me to join them. So of course I jumped at the chance to be able to explore the valley. And of course they, being students, they were the last ones to get up in the morning. And so we were the last team to leave camp. And all of the other teams, went deeper into the valley. So we thought we'll go in the other direction. And uh, we soon found a little side valley where we uh, drove in as far as we could and then started walking further into the valley. And of course, immediately we meet a local family who invite us in for tea. And so here we are, and it's about 11 o'clock at this time. And I'm thinking we're really not gonna see very much today. <laughs> um, it's already 11 o'clock and we're, we, you know, we've, we've only seen a few pheasants and a buzzard, I think at this point. Um, and uh, you know, have this wonderful hospitality. And we get talking about um, why we're here. And so we say, oh, we're here for a, for a, a nature watching festival. And they said, oh, we, we sometimes see snow leopards behind our house. And uh, we're sort of like, what? <laughs> um, and so we sort of check that they really mean snow leopard. Um, 
because uh, sometimes the names in you know, the language there can be confusion. But yeah, absolutely, they said Sir Leopard. So, so after tea, he said um, that we'll take you up and you know let's have a look. So here we are walking up behind the house um, up the mountain, and uh, we're looking around and looking. We're scanning, and we see lots of vultures, lots of blue sheep, lots of wildlife, um, but no sign of of any snow leopards. And it gets to about three o'clock, and we. We know we have to be back at the camp for the local governor uh, who's going to be opening the forum officially the, the, the conference so we we don't have long left and so we have one last scan of the area and suddenly on the top of a rock there's a lump that i was sure wasn't there before uh, so fortunately have the telescope we set the telescope up and uh, have a look at this lump and it turns out to be a, a snow leopard and um this is a little bit of video I was able to take. And we were watching, we were watching that first animal for 45 minutes before we realized there were two. So Justine mentioned that they, they rest for about 75% of the time. And one of them was just resting under that rock. And we never even noticed it until the first one went down and they started interacting and moving. So it just shows their camouflage is, is uh, incredible. And so this is my first ever sighting of a snow leopard and absolutely blown away. And the thing that really shocked me was how relaxed these animals were in our presence. So they clearly knew we were there. We were about 400 meters away, something like that. Um, and they were completely relaxed. And so this spoke volumes to me about the relationship between the local community here and the animals, because if they were persecuted in any way, they would have been out there before we before we even realized they were there. So uh, eventually we get back to the camp and um, our video earns us an audience with the local governor. And we, we mentioned the fact that, uh, you know, that, that, that a lot of people love to see snow leopard and they pay a lot of money to go to India in the DAC um, to, to have a chance to see one in the wild. And you know, there could potentially be an opportunity to do something here in this community, uh, small scale and, um, high value. Um, and so he was, he was very interested in, in the idea. So he asked for a paper. So we wrote a paper together with Shan Shui uh, about how this could work in a community. Um, did a couple of pilot trips just to show that it wasn't a one-off. Um, and then finally, we got the go-ahead for the project in, in July, 2017. So the local community was, was in favor and um, we, we started to put together a training plan. So we, we did, um, before I knew it, I was on a plane to, to Yushu uh, about to start a training session with, with yak herders. Um, and I was very worried. I thought, you know, are they really going to come to a training session? Are they, are they, are they going to take this seriously? And I, I needn't have worried at all because they're the most amazing students ever. Uh, and we had the most amazing fun. So we, we learned about other examples of wildlife related tourism that support conservation in other parts of the world. We did basic medical training with them so that they could deal with any um, ailments or and things like altitude sickness which is possible for visitors uh, we did, even did cooking training um, so they could do a variety of dishes and even cater for vegetarians um, this was a lot of fun uh, we did home training too so volunteers visited each of the households in the village um, to help them prepare for visitors um, and to produce information sheets about each family so that when visitors were coming to stay, they could get information in advance about who they were staying with, what their names were, how old they were, what they did, how many, what pets they have, et cetera. Uh, a lot of information and um, you know, big effort by the volunteers to put all this together. Um, and of course the training that we did was actually very much two-way learning. So they helped us with a lot of knowledge because they, they have amazing knowledge about where the animals can be found. And this map shows the sort of that we put together in the training. And you can see that almost every mountain has this sort of yellow dot. Um, so nearly every mountain has snow leopards on. <laughs> um, and, and there's lots of other wildlife around as well. So there, there are other cats like lynx and common leopard. There's white lipped deer, there's wolf, there's bears, brown bears. Um, and there are also some very uh, interesting and unusual birds as well, like Tibetan bunting and Tibetan babaks, which have very, very limited ranges on the plateau. So this was a wonderful, sharing of, of knowledge and they, they, they shared with us also a lot of knowledge about the plants and trees there's some very interesting legends about some of the trees and some of them are thought to be more than a thousand years old 
Um, so we learned a lot from them. Also about the signs of the animals. So on the left here, that uh, bare area is a typical scrape um, where snow leopards and, and common leopards mark their territory. They use their back legs to scrape. Um, and on the right there, that's a, a bare scratching tree where they sharpen their claws. Uh, worryingly quite close to this guy's house. <laughs> Um, and then we're able to get some resources too. So a Taiwanese optics company um, donated a pair of binoculars for each of the families to be involved in, the, in this project. Um, and also we, we got hold of this book, The Field Guide to the Biodiversity, San Zhang Yuan. Um, so each family has a copy of that to help visitors to, to identify some of the things that they're, they're seeing on their trip. And produced a website to uh, help promote the project. It's bilingual English and Chinese has a lot of information about the the area the families the wildlife um, you can even uh, make queries and book uh, through the website to stay and the way the project works um, is that uh, because of the sensitivity of the area uh, there are permits required so anyone who visits this area must have a, a permit uh, and there's a strict limit on numbers so there's a maximum of 12 people at any one time allowed in the valley and um, we have a strict code of conduct for visitors, uh, which was put together by the local community. So this is about respecting the culture, um, taking away your rubbish, uh, helping the local people to pick up any litter that you find as you're going around. So hopefully your, your visit can actually have a positive impact um, on the local environment. And then there are activities you can do. So it's not just about watching snow leopards or, or other wildlife. You can spend a day as a yak herder. You can go hiking, you can uh, do stargazing at night. The sky is incredibly clear up there, as you can imagine. Um, horse riding also. And they have a strict rotation policy. So the 22 families that participate in this project has an equal, all have an equal turn. So they rotate. So the next group of visitors will go to the next family on the list. And importantly, all of the revenue from this tourism project stays in the community. So 45% of any given uh, visit uh, 45 percent stays with the host family who look after those visitors 45 percent goes to a community fund that um, is spent on community-wide benefits and they have a, a, a committee set up to uh, establish how to spend that money and in the final 10 percent goes towards community-based conservation of snow leopard uh, projects within that community so that was a really important principle uh, at the beginning when, when we set up this project um, just a picture of the horse. This has to be one of the best places in the world to go horse riding. Um, it's just incredible. And there's some really fantastic trails um, to go horse riding. You can spend a day as a yak herder. So you can uh, milk the yak in the morning, uh, take the yak out to pasture. Um, and then later in the yak, during the day while the yak are grazing, you uh, can make yogurt, uh, bread and other local foods and then in the afternoon you have to go up round up all the yak and bring them back in to the compound so every night all of the yak are brought in um, to protect them from the predators uh, so which sort of just shows how how um uh, how many predators there are around that they need to do that every day so of course as well as snow leopards you have common leopard and bear and wolf that are all potential predators for for the yak um, and then just a little video of some of the wildlife. This, these are some of the small mammals that you get in the, in the valley. This is a Himalayan marmot, a young one. Can't work out which flower tastes best. Um, we have the, the, the woolly hair, which is um, a long coated hair that's, that's um, found on the, on the Tibetan plateau. And then this is one of the, the favorites, Glover's pika, very cute little animal. And then of course the jewel in the crown is the, the snow leopard. And this, this um, was taken at midday on an August day uh, in the summer. This is a female uh, who's just failed to catch a mama. So she almost certainly has young cubs. And um, so she has to hunt frequently to feed them. And so even in the midday heat, uh, she's out hunting. And we think of snow leopards as being in these sort of bare rocky habitats like we saw earlier with the mystery photo spot snow leopard. 
um, but sometimes you can find them uh, in these incredibly beautiful wildflower meadows a bit lower down um, where, where they hunt for marmots. So. And then some of the visitors, some of the first visitors we had come, this guy is Tormod, he's from Norway. And um, his reaction on seeing his snow leopard. Tormod, that was ridiculous. What's just happened? I just saw the snow leopard. <laughs> Congratulations. Distant, but without the shadow of the dot, like standing in a profile, just flapping his tail slowly and then just moving up behind some rocks. I just <laughs> wow, what the hell, man! Wow, that is crazy. Still pounding, man. So, um, the project actually started getting visitors in 2018, um, and obviously last year, 2020, was a bit of a write-off uh, for everyone. Um, and so, as at the end of 2019, we'd had 98 groups of people visiting, um, involving 302 uh, individuals. And we just broke the 1 million yuan mark um, at the end of 2019. And all of that revenue has stayed um, in the community. Um, and the project was awarded the first ever concession for a community-based tourism project inside Chinese National Park. Um, and it's supporting local incomes, raising money for conservation and giving tourists the experience of a lifetime. Um, it's also contributing to policy development of China's national parks. So it, it's showing how tourism is possible in sensitive, environmentally sensitive areas, provided it's low volume and well managed. And I think that's those two things are really important: the, the low volume and and being well managed. Um, and also, the, what the pandemic has shown, you know, is that many areas that are reliant on tourism have been really have really suffered uh, due to the lack of travel due to the pandemic. Um, but this community has been very resilient because the, I think importantly, this the, the revenue from the tourism from the project is is just a supplement to their main income. So it's, it's not their main source of income. Um, their primary income comes from the cordyceps, the, the so-called caterpillar fungus harvest. And so this tourism project um, is just extra for them. And so they've been very resilient through through the pandemic. Um, and then just looking to the future, we, the project, um, there's been a lot of interest from other um, places in, in San Yuan and also elsewhere. And uh, there are discussions ongoing at the moment with two other villages about setting up similar community-based projects. And of course, each place will have individual biodiversity too, unique biodiversity. Um, uh, so yeah, some will have snow leopards, some will have other, other wildlife. Um, so there is potential for a sort of network of community-based uh, wildlife tourism projects across San Yuan, and I can envisage, you know, in a few years' time, that there could be a really cool trail that you could do, sort of going fly to Yushu, and then stay a few days in each of these community-based projects and have have a wonderful experience. And I think one of the things I would say is that for most visitors who have come, the feedback we've had is that actually, the you know, besides the wildlife, um, that the most um, impressive thing about coming and staying here is to have that really authentic experience of staying with a local Tibetan family in their home um, and being taken around and, and just experiencing that that amazing culture. Uh, so I think uh, you know in, in many ways it, it's it's everyone's a winner. The local people uh, are a winner. Um, the the wildlife is a winner because they're getting more uh, conservation funds and the visitors have, have a wonderful time too. And I think one of the benefits um, also is that it helps to reduce human wildlife conflict tension. So when local communities see value in the wildlife, um, that helps to reduce the risk that there may be retaliatory killings of uh, some of those predators uh, when they do take yak, uh, which they often do. Um, so I think on average, each family have about 100 yak. They lose about five a year. To, to predators. And so in some places, there is quite a serious tension um, between humans and animals. And so I think projects like this help to reduce the risk of that uh, conflict happening. So um, just very finally, this, this, um, th this project, I have to say, has been the most rewarding thing that I've ever worked on and working with these, these people. And um, they're, they're wonderful, we'll have a wonderful sense of humor. 
So I just wanted to share this video. This is Renching Dajia, who's one of the senior people in the, in the Ang Sai community. And um, I asked him what a snow leopard sounds like. I said, I'd never heard one. Um, and so he, he showed um, us what okay, they so sound what like. Okay, so what does a snow leopard sound like? Is this from a local at all? <laughs> and now I can play actually what one really sounds like. So you can compare whether he's, how good he is. Um, okay, so what? Do... Okay, so I'll end it there. I think I've gone a bit over, so I apologise for that. Amazing. This is absolutely amazing. Thank you so much, but Justin, for giving us sort of the big picture and understanding of this magical animal. And uh, Terry, I think you just made everybody want to leave the room and sign up. Where do we sign up to go? <laughs> uh, right. I don't think I'm the only one. If anyone wants to go, you can say <laughs> yes. And we'll, we'll see. <laughs> now, a question. I once uh, went hiking, tracking for pandas in the wild um, in Changqing Nature Reserve for like three days. I couldn't find anything. I, I didn't see anything. How likely are visitors to the Valley of Cats? What are the chances of, to see one? And how long do you have to be there? Yeah, I mean, that's a, it's a question a lot of people ask. Um, there are a few factors involved. I would say, I mean, I think um, just to give you a sense of the experience so far, um, groups that have spent at least three days in the valley um, have about a 60 to 70% chance of seeing a snow leopard on average. Um, there, I mean, it, it's not just a sort of percentage chance, you know, there, there are a lot of variables. So it depends how much time you put in uh, looking, actively looking, um, it's luck, obviously. Um, so, you know, some, I, I've known some people to arrive literally at their homestay and uh, they just unpack and they sort of just stand outside the, the homestay, just taking in the breathtaking scenery and suddenly they see a snow leopard like on a rock um, looking at them, you know, within an hour of them arriving. Um, whereas other groups, you know, have spent several days um, really trying hard and have failed. So it's, it's a really elusive animal and you know you you need luck and and to put in effort and you know there's absolutely no guarantee as justine will will confirm I mean, justine's been studying snow leopards for for many many years and i think she could probably count the number of sightings probably on one hand i'm, I'm guessing really well, yeah maybe can... i've seen four well, i mean we color them as well so they that doesn't count i guess <laughs> The ones we've seen naturally in the wild have been four. Um, but I think, Meizang, bring Terry with you and your successes go up by 200%. <laughs> That's what Bruce, my dear friend Bruce Austin, just said. I, I got to have some karma, Terry karma. To, yes. <laughs> to, to find her. Absolutely. Um, so I'm very curious because as you were talking and I am elbow deep reading, of course, nothing but Matheson book on the snow leopard, right? Fascinating book. And he finds no snow, snow leopard after schlepping around like tons of things and for hiking for two months. Um, why is that? Has conservation improved? in China side or why, why is that Justine from your study? That's a really good, uh, really good question. Um, and we do get asked that a lot. I mean, they, we actually use a quote from that book uh, where at the end he asks, have you seen a snow leopard? And the response is, no, I haven't. But isn't that wonderful? Yes. Because maybe um, you haven't seen it, but they've seen us and that they're still there in their habitat. Um, but anyway, so I love that quote because it also highlights with the tourism programs like Terry described, there's so much else in the snow leopard habitat to watch the palace cats, the pikas, you know, the people. Um, so it's a great reminder of all the diversity and amazing things uh, throughout snow leopard habitat. Um, but to answer your question, 
we think that, I mean, as other big cats, they can habituate to people. Um, so uh, they can get more comfortable with people being around. So certain areas of the snow leopard range have habituated to people observing them. For example, in Ladakh, India is another uh, high uh, hot spot where people do see a lot of snow leopards. And this has changed over time with people understanding where to go, you know, certain sightings areas where you see a huge vast area of a valley or a rock face. So you might have a higher chance of seeing them, but also they've been habituated to people. And there might be, as uh, Terry shared, uh, less poaching or less retaliatory killing in some areas, which makes uh, some snow leopards more comfortable uh, being around. But that, that's what we think. And of course, we're also in, uh, have increased access to these areas, right? Uh, by flying, by driving. Um, so as with increasing access, uh, we're encroaching further into their habitats and seeing more snow leopards. Uh, but I think local people might say that they probably see as many snow leopards as previously because they would have seen snow leopards hurting their yak and, and elsewhere. So yeah, mm. uh, does that answer yes. the question? Yes. Yeah. Um, but, but maybe there are also, you know, uh, do they migrate or are there certain regions? Um, no, so, so snow leopards are very territorial. Um, so they'll have their own home ranges. And, and it's interesting, um, from the few areas we've studied populations very intensively with collaring, so we have like a, a data from every five hours, you'll see that males tend to have separate territories. So they don't really overlap and they really defend their territories. Um, and then there might be female territories within the male's territory. So there might be two females and that would be a very lucky male if he's got the two females. And you might have the males around, less lucky, wanting to get that territory. Um, so they're very territorial and will stay within uh, certain home ranges. Um, uh, yeah, that's what we predict. Yeah, fascinating, fascinating. Well, we have quite a few questions. I'll try to get to them and then we'll get to Gina who raised a hand. Uh, we'll get to the ones here and then uh, a list from premium previously submitted. Uh, here's one. Are you either of you Chinese citizens? Uh, you have this amazing, incredible access to this area. Um, are American tourists welcome? Or is this a changing thing based on geopolitic climate? <laughs> Shall I answer that? Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, yeah, so I think this particular part, I mean, this, this uh, Angsai, um, Sanjiang Yuan in Sanjiang Yuan is in Qinghai province. So it's, although it's Tibetan uh, area, it's not actually Tibet. So it's much less um, sensitive and uh, restricted for tourists. Um, so ordinarily, it's no problem for, for anyone um, to, to visit. Uh, obviously, during the COVID period, there were increased restrictions, and, uh, including on all foreigners. Uh, even if you were based in in China, um, but that has now has now relaxed. So so even foreigners that are based in China can go to this this place, no problem. Um, and hopefully, obviously, in future when when things open up, um, it will again be open to to all. Um, so there's no special access required other than a, a permit, uh, which is free uh, that you get when you apply to stay here. So the, you just have to provide copy of your passport and a short paragraph about uh, why you want to visit uh, and then that's it and then that's they, they will issue the permit um, and allocate you a homestay so okay. it's it's ordinarily no problem so that's applying with with your organization valley valley of the cats valley of the cats yeah so that that's that's a direct link to the community so shan shui helped to facilitate that with the community so the, the community will will allocate um the homestay uh, and and they will collect the money at the end uh, of, of the trip mm. and make all the arrangements so everything can be done through that through that website okay uh, the questions will bounce between the travel side and the conservation side now heidi has a question what's the latest news and progress on transboundary conservation for snow leopards what do you think uh, is the biggest challenge 
That's a great question because as you saw from the map, uh, majority of the snow leopard range is actually along these bordered areas uh, throughout Central and South Asia. So it's really important to be working at multi-country level. And uh, recently, actually, there's been this great government initiative um, called GSLEP, which is, which is called the Global Snow Leopard Ecosystem Program. And it's actually all range country governments have to come together to sit at the same table in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan. So it was led by the then president of, of Kyrgyzstan. And he brought all the head of states together to talk about snow leopards. And they all agreed and created the Bishkek declaration and committed to uh, safeguarding snow leopard populations. So recently there's been huge uh, advancements and progress in countries coming together in this like unique form of uh, GSLAP. So yeah, yeah, there's been a lot of progress um, at the government level. And then, then in terms of researchers coming together, such as the Snow Leopard Network, there's a lot of exchange uh, throughout the Snow Leopard range. Um, because, uh, you know, what we do in maybe in Pakistan might be really informative to what we do in China. And we try to really exchange um, best practices uh, for what and what might be new threats that are happening across the range, such as climate change. We won't be able to understand this threat from just one area. We really need to get a bigger picture of what's happening. And there's been much more collaboration across the range. Uh, even during this COVID area, when we're stuck at home, many of us researchers throughout the world, um, we've been all coming on online and actually sharing even more um, about what we're doing. Um, so that's been one thing, one positive thing about COVID. There's been even more exchange across the snow leopard range, which is encouraging. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I, I think like for um, formats like this, you know, we get to learn mm. from you uh, such far flung areas of China or other parts. Now, on conservation, uh, following on that same theme, since Terry, we are talking about bringing more visitors into these sensitive regions. Um, what are there specific initiatives to educate the users to uh, travel education, for example, uh, right? How are they, what distance they're supposed to stay from the animal and what sort of behavior is proper in nature? What, what's being done there? Yeah, I think you, you, you raised a really important point. And I think firstly, I would say that um, in my view, and I think, I think in most people, view it's important to give people access to these places in some way um, because it does uh, really make that connection and people can feel that personal connection with nature which can help to stimulate interest in conservation and and, um, and um, you know will to protect these areas so having access to some areas I think there's a real value to doing that and of course it's also really important to manage that access because we all know that you know if people are allowed to just do what they want you'll always get a few people that try to get that bit closer to a snow leopard to get that better picture and and so on you know and, and and bad behaviors like baiting for example you know which can occur also so it's really important that projects like this are managed um in a, in a very strict way and i think in with this particular project the community there's been a really strong dialogue between Chantry Conservation Centre, the community um, and others about a code of conduct for visitors. So they, there's a, um, they, they've developed uh, a code of conduct that everyone who visits must read and sign um, and respect. And, you know, if, if uh, and, there, and there are uh, guidelines in there about um, only watching from the tracks, you know, not running up the mountains to, to chase snow leopards. But watching from the tracks um you know obviously if an animal approaches you you know that's okay but um don't go go chasing them um there are also strict regulations about things like drones uh, so there's no use of drones allowed there's no use of spotlighting at night um, which some people uh, like to do so it's it's pretty strict um in, in this particular project and I think they've been on, urged on the side of caution uh, in, in all of these rules, but certainly it's a big part of, of um, when visitors come is they must uh, read this, 
uh, accept it and, and, and there are people there to answer any questions and also to explain why uh, there are these restrictions. Um, so hopefully everyone who comes you know, can appreciate why there are these restrictions and learn more. And I think most importantly, fall in love with, with nature and snow leopards, you know, and, and go away thinking we must um, do more to protect these animals and the places that they need. So yeah, I hope that answers your question. No, be beautifully said, beautifully said, because I, I feel like traveling in these nature areas and national parks in China, um, the, there's often a mistake I find of completely separating people from nature. You know, tourists yeah. are on this fixed path. You don't have any opportunity to venture into nature to really sort of get to know nature and fall in love with it. You, you don't feel the compassion to protect things you don't uh, have access to, right? Taking a photograph doesn't quite do the job. And, and I, think, I think your project is just absolutely unique in the sense that you bring people, uh, travelers and locals together and with this common appreciation protection of this magical um, cat. Yeah. I, I would say that uh, just, just very briefly to add to that, I think, yeah, there are certain criteria that are needed for a project like this to be successful. So um, obviously having the wildlife is, is important because you need to be able to attract people. But yeah. also um, having the local government support. So the local government in this area is really progressive on this. They see the wildlife as the biggest asset and they don't want to do anything to, to jeopardize that. Right. Um, and thirdly, the community has an existing structure um, that really lends itself to this project. So they have an existing structure to deal with any issues that come up in the community to work together and, and so on. And so being able to use that structure to handle any issues that come up with this project you know, has been really invaluable. And I think you know, this, this project like this is not suitable for everywhere. I think you know, there are certain conditions that need to be in place. Because I think in other countries, there have been examples of, of similar types of project that have really gone wrong because of breakdown in the social cohesion and you know, jealousy between families and so on. So it's, it's, um, it's really important that it's managed very carefully. Yes, absolutely. Well, we've already um, exceeded the time. Yes, Justine, any, anything you want to add? And then uh, you can prepare a few last words and then we'll close soon. Let you go back. Go ahead, Justine. Sure. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to add um, that, uh, like Terry mentioned, cohesion and uh, co you know, programs like tourism is more than ever important for the long term success of conservation programs or tourism programs like this. Um, and the benefits not going to only a few households, but the whole community. Right. Yeah. And then everyone can be on board on this about for this program. And that, that has been shown to be really important, not only for tourism, but other community conservation work um, throughout the snow leopard range. And as uh, Terry said, it's it's very much should come from uh, local initiatives. So come from them. What works here? What can we do to safeguard the species, whether it's tourism, whether it's uh, something else? And that's so important. Instead of this copy paste method, we think that in terms of community conservation, um, that has you know many pitfalls. Uh, while programs like this that really come from from the ground, bottom up, as one can say, really have more. Um, likely to success yeah just wanted to add that but oh it's so sad it's already over amazing oh, we want to stay here forever <laughs> you to go to bed. it's four o'clock a.m i know <laughs> but thank you this is incredible work i think um you know it, it makes me it's definitely on my list as one of the first places first project to get involved when when COVID's over and back in china and i'm sure it's in the mind of many of our uh, listeners today and terry any um parting words you want to share with the audience here i think the only thing i would say i mean i love the enthusiasm for the project and, I, and of course you know really welcome um visitors from across the world uh, when things are allowed the only thing i would i would say is that the conditions are very basic so this isn't for everyone, you know, this isn't a five star uh, trip. <laughs> there are no um, 
no showers, you know, no running water. The only water comes from the streams and they boil, boil it and you know, they can provide a bowl of hot water every morning or evening you know, to have a wash, but it's very basic. No toilets in most cases. You have to, it's like wild camping, uh, find a tree. Um, you know, and, and of course the food is quite basic. Uh, but if you, can, if you can tolerate those things, it, you will have the experience of a lifetime without a question of a doubt. Uh, so yeah. I just wanted to <laughs> to well, I, I think that makes it even more appealing. And while China will try to sort of cushy it up, but glamping it a, a little bit. <laughs> but, um, it sounds amazing. Thank you so much. And thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, th this was truly an incredible hour. Um, I've learned a tremendous amount. And thank you, uh, Justine. I wish you uh, lots of luck leading this effort in snow leopard conservation. I'm sure more and more will join you. And Terry will definitely join you looking for snow leopards or birds <laughs> all around the country. Great. Well, thank, thank you so much for the opportunity and, and, yeah. and to everyone for joining today. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. We, just one last thing, mate. We often say snow leopards can't roar. As we heard the sound uh, Terry shared, it's not really a roar. So we're all <laughs> roaring for snow leopards together. So thank you for letting us roar for them today <laughs> with you, mate Zhang. Thank you. And uh, one last word for everybody. Um, our book of the month is Lisa C's on her, no her novel, Snowflower and the Secret Fan, end of July. Join us again. Thank you again for taking the time. Have a wonderful day, evening, night sleep, and we'll see you again. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.